All right, well, <clears throat> as I already told you, we are continuing Galatians this morning. Um, it has been a while since we've been in the book of Galatians. I guess it would be four weeks, right? So what I'd like to do is, I, I, I don't want to start from the beginning and read the whole book, but what I'd like to do is begin in verse 1 of chapter 4. To look, just to read the first seven verses, that's what we looked at last time we were together. And um, then we're going to move on from there to verses 8 through 20. Uh, but I just want to read this to get us back, sort of giving us a little bit of the context of um, what Paul is saying here. So, as I read this, let's, let's give careful attention to it because this is God's Word. And remember, the evening <laughs> is meant to try, you know, to buttress that conviction. Um, but again, the Spirit of God will certainly strengthen that conviction as His work is strengthened in us. Now, so Galatians 4 verse 1, Paul writes this, Now, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner and not only when I am present with you. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Well, I hope to unravel uh, what it is that uh, Paul is, is saying in this. As we, <clears throat> as we read through it, I'm sure some of the things that he's saying are making some sense, but sometimes it's hard to follow the train of thought. But again, these are a series of challenges to the Galatians to think carefully about the direction that they're going and what we might, well, I think what we should see as a, um, a tr uh, an expression of intense love on the part of the apostle for the Galatians. Now... Remember that Paul has been showing us in the book of Galatians why God gave the ceremonial law, and this is just sort of generally uh, a review of everything we've seen. He never gave it to be the way of salvation. I think we understand that. But as a teacher to point to the way. Remember the Mosaic covenant was added to a covenant that already existed, and that covenant that existed already was the Abrahamic covenant that promised a seed through whom all the nations would be blessed. Well, the purpose of the Mosaic covenant was really to teach them, the Jews, their need of this promised seed of Abraham. Okay? 
That's really its whole purpose. Now, that was one of the analogies Paul used. But he also went on to tell us that it was given to the Jews as a guardian or a manager uh, to, to govern the church, to manage it while it was under age, like an heir who, while he's still young, is under these guardians and really is a slave to these guardians, even though he is the heir, until the heir should reach the age of maturity. Um, and where he's no longer then enslaved to these things. And Paul is saying that maturity has come with the coming of the promised seed of Abraham into the world. And so now the manager has passed away. So now that Jesus has come, we're no longer enslaved to this ceremonial law. But rather, we are sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are no longer, again, you know, in bondage, as it were, sort of keeping up all these ceremonies, but rather now we serve God out of love. Paul said in that first section in verses 1 through 7, we have the spirit of adoption. Again, very, very important. Who not only shows us that we belong to God by working His image in us, and we'll come back to that towards the end of this sermon, but that knowing that we belong to Him, that we are also the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, how do we know that we will inherit the kingdom? It's not just because we believe that we're trusting in Jesus Christ or we believe that Jesus is who He said He is and so forth. That has to be true. But how do we know we're really trusting in Him? It's the spirit of adoption who not only convinces us that God loves us uh, because we can call Him our Father and know that's true, but who has stamped the image of Christ in our lives and is making us more and more like Him. Now, this morning, as I've said, Paul challenges the Galatians in a variety of ways to show us, really, he's showing them, but I want us to see the same thing applies to us, okay, how foolish it would be for us to place ourselves again under a system of works in order to justify ourselves. And that's really the whole issue here. And the Judaizers, that's not the only way. Paul is saying that the Galatians themselves came out of a works-based religion. And now having come out of that, do you want to go back under that again? No. We have to avoid that like the plague. Trust in Jesus Christ alone. So we want to see these challenges, but we also want to see Paul's motive. Just the expression of love. He, he likens himself to a woman in labor seeking to give birth to them uh, again. I've already, you know, you're already born once, but, but now it appears you, you need to be born again. And so I'm in labor again seeking to bring you to birth. And uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever used that expression uh, or even thought that with regard to, you know, evangelizing someone. We're seeking to bring them to, to birth. But, but the motive needs to be out of love. And that was his motive, his intense love and concern for the welfare of the church and really the church throughout the ages for our welfare. So the first thing, he, he begins by asking this question in verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Having been freed, will you be enslaved again? Okay, verses 8 through 11, but let me read verses 8, eight through 9. He says, however, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Now, Paul, first of all, points to what they were, before they heard the gospel, before they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, when they didn't know the true God, they were serving other gods, which he says are not really other gods. They're, they're really just idols, okay? There's, there's only one true God, and every other so-called God is simply a fiction. It, it's a lie. It's an idol that man has imagined that he's made up and has fashioned into various metals. Remember how Paul argued on the Areopagus before the philosophers 
that these idols that they worship cannot be God. Acts 17, verse 29. Being then the children of God, and what he means by that is, you know, we are his offspring, right? Um, he made us. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. I mean, what is made, as we saw in our apologetic series, remember? What has been created, what has been made, cannot be greater than that which made it. And if you're going to attribute creation to these idols, you need to realize that we're alive and they're not. Remember how um, uh, God contrasts the idols uh, to himself. You know, they have eyes they can't see, they have ears they can't hear, they have mouths they can't eat. They're dead. You, they did not create you, but the living God created you. The true God who actually made them is infinitely greater than this. So they were worshiping idols, false gods. And being without the true God, Paul says they were without hope. Okay, they were looking forward to a Christless eternity because of their guilt, because of their sin. But God didn't leave them in that condition. The Lord had mercy on them, verse 9. But now you have come to know God. Okay, God graciously sent his gospel to them through the apostle Paul. And they had entered into a personal saving relationship with him through God's Son. More importantly, Paul says, now they were known by God. And that, you know, being known by God doesn't mean, well, God now knows who you are. You know, he didn't know who you were before, but now that you've come to Jesus, now he knows you. That word known means, in this case, certainly loved by him, okay? So you've come into this relationship with God, and now you are loved by God, okay? And this is, he's building up, of course, to a climax. This is your, your condition. This is your situation. By the way, I, I do need to say something just as an aside here, but we won't, don't want to lose the, the main train of thought. Paul is still looking at them. He's still seeing them and treating them as believers, okay? He's saying, you've come to know God, you're, you're known by God. Even though they were deceived and they seemed perilously close to proving that they were not true believers. Now, I, I just want to bring this out because this shows us, again, Paul's love and his patience that he had towards them. And it also shows us the kind of love and patience we should have towards one another when we fall into sin. Because sometimes our tendency is, you know, this person, that person uh, committed this, did this. They can't be a Christian, okay? Well, I mean, the, the Galatians are in danger of, of basically falling into a work system. And Paul is still looking at them, still treating them as true believers, though he will challenge them, okay? But now, getting back to the main point, having been given this greatest of all possible blessings, which is having come into this relationship with God, Paul then asks them this in verse 9. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Okay, now, notice that Paul is... This is the way he characterizes false religion. This is what we saw before. Any religion that requires that we work our way into God's favor, that we have to be good enough before God will accept us, which is every religion outside of biblical Christianity. And even biblical Christianity, in many cases, has been turned into a works religion, such as, as Rome, you know, and, and in some cases, Lutheranism as well. We do have to be very careful here. Not all Lutherans, and, and we need to, but there are some who have. And many liberal churches, they've, they've, they've turned it into a works religion. But Paul is saying that was true of what they were involved in, and it's also true of what they are now getting involved in. This is something we saw before. Paul is, is saying what the Judaizers are teaching you, this, you know, this way to be right with God, is, is pretty much the same thing that you came out of. Even though it was a totally pagan religion, you were still doing these things to try to be accepted by God. 
But what they're doing now, okay, that what he's referring to right now, as far as being enslaved again, is you were freed from this pagan religion, and now you're going to be enslaved by the Judaizers' works-based religion. Okay? He says in verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. What he's referring to here are the ceremonial holy days okay, that the Judaizers were, were teaching. The, the fast days, the feast days, the new moons, the ceremonial Sabbaths, the feasts of Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles, the, the sabbatical year. And the year of Jubilee, that's all a part of the Jewish tradition, okay? You're observing those things. Now, Paul, remember, has said, these are things which a believer, whether Jew or Gentile, they were allowed to do these things. They could. Paul kept them as a part of his Jewish heritage, but not as the way to be justified, okay? That's, that's the division here. That's, that's the point. That's the problem when you move these things out of the arena of Christian liberty into that of merit, you destroy the gospel. And Paul has already told us anyone who teaches anything like that is accursed. And anyone who listens to anybody like that will also end up accursed. <clears throat> now, let me just draw another aside here. We need to be careful that we understand Paul here he is not including the moral Sabbath in this list. If they were observing that day, that's good, okay? But it's the other ceremonial days that they were observing that wasn't good. He's, you know, Paul is not talking about the moral standard that can never change. He's referring to the ceremonial law or the ceremonial Sabbaths that can and did change. Remember, they were meant to point to Christ but now that he's come, those things are no longer binding. They are simply matters of Christian liberty. Now, let me just say one more thing. We also don't keep the moral Sabbath or the Ten Commandments to be justified either, do we? Yeah, we, we don't keep the ceremonial law or the moral law to be justified. Christ kept the ceremonial law. He fulfilled it. Kept Christ, Christ kept the moral law and fulfilled it, we are justified by trusting in Him. But the point I'm making here is simply this, that, that the moral Sabbath is not a matter of Christian liberty. Okay? It is a matter of Christian duty. So it's a part of God's Ten Commandments. It's a part of His household rules. It shows us how we are to love as members of His family. And we are to keep those, and we are to love in that way. But again, we don't do it to be saved. We do it because God has saved us. <clears throat> Again, when we add anything to God's grace, anything, any rules we need to keep, any rituals, any ceremonies, even obedience to the moral commandments to justify ourselves or to maintain that justification, anything beyond simply trusting in Jesus Christ, His perfect obedience, His righteousness, his sacrifice on the cross, we become the slaves of a system that can never give us a clear conscience or make us right with God. We're enslaved to it, and we'll never do good enough. We can only be justified by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to keep works out of justification. God has done it all through His Son alone. Now, secondly, Paul asks then, in light of this, you, you want to be slaves again? Whether everything he had done for them really was for nothing, amounted to nothing. He says in verse 11, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And remember, van, vanity, vain, it just simply means emptiness or nothingness. It was all for nothing. Now, Paul just gave them the benefit of the doubt, didn't he? You know, he, he says, now that you've come to know God or been known by God, are you going to go this direction? And now he's saying, I'm afraid that maybe all my work for you is for nothing, okay? He gave them the benefit of the doubt, but now he's challenging their conversion. Now, why is he doing that? I think it's most likely to make them think, not because he necessarily thought they weren't Christians, although they're getting precariously close, but he wants them to think. 
If you turn to the Judaizers' interpretation of the ceremonial law, which turned it into a system of works to justify you, if you do that, then everything I have done for you has been for nothing. Now, again, this is just simply the point that Paul emphasizes again and again. You're probably getting tired of hearing about it, but it, you know, let it sink into your minds because you are going to forget once we leave this subject. To turn to works in any way is to lose Christ. Paul doesn't want that to happen to them, and so he's trying to shake them up. Now, think about this in our own experience in, as we try to reach out to other people. You know, like Paul, uh, we should be like Paul, you know, in trying to reach out to other people and, and trying to bring them to faith in Christ. That You can spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to reach out to them, maybe even seeing them come into a church, although that's becoming increasingly rare today. We should not you know, think it to be an impossible thing because it's in God's hands and not ours. But we can do all this work, all this effort, and bring them into the church only to see them begin turning away from Christ and turning back into the world. Now, there comes a time when somebody falls into that state, you know, that we need to challenge them to, in order to wake them up even to question the truth of their Christian profession. You say you're a Christian, but you're living this way, which is contrary to Christ. And the reason we do that is not to, to chastise them, but rather to admonish them in love in the hopes that the Lord might wake them up and turn them around so that they'll see their predicament, that they're teetering on the brink and they'll turn back around and again embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's what Paul is doing here, to wake them up, to shake them up. And sometimes we need to do the same. Sometimes we need the same. Thirdly, Paul reminds them of how he used his liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the proper way of using that liberty, to encourage them to do the same thing. Now, that, that's what I believe he has in mind here in verse 12, where it doesn't seem to make sense on the, you know, on first reading, he says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. What in the world does that mean? Well, I think what it means is that when Paul first came to them with the gospel, he accommodated himself to them. You know, he became as they are, which is what Paul did as, as a part of his evangelistic strategy. Remember what he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 20 through 22. And again, we need to be reminded of this because it, it, it tells us how to reach other people. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as those without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. And what Paul means by this is he accommodates himself to his audience. He seeks to relate to them as much as he can without sacrificing any moral principles, he ministered to the Jews as one who kept the ceremonial law. That was his freedom to do. But he didn't do it, of course, to be justified. But when he came to the Gentiles, he came to them as one who wasn't under the ceremonial law, not as a Jew, but rather as one of them, you know, as one without law, though not without the law of Christ, not as being lawless, still keeping the moral law, the Ten Commandments, so that he might have a better hearing for the gospel so that they could relate to him. You know, if, if um, again, if we come to other people in, in all of our religious trappings, if we happen to have them, um, or saying our nomenclature, the way we speak, you know, our techni technical words and so forth, if, if we don't seek to relate to them, we're, we're not going to make a connection. We're not going to be able to, to reach them. So Paul came to them as, as a Gentile, essentially, Though again, 
keeping the Ten Commandments. So he came to them not under the ceremonial law, and he pleads with them in the light of their present circumstances to do the same. He says, look, I set it aside to come to you to bring the gospel to you. I have the liberty to do that, and you have that same liberty, and so you need to do the same. So what he's saying is if they couldn't free themselves from relying on the ceremonial law to justify themselves, they needed just to set it aside, which Paul showed that they could do through his own example. <clears throat> you don't have to keep it. I came to you not keeping it. You do the same. Fourthly, and this is the next to the last point, Paul wants them to know that through all of this they haven't offended him but he questions whether he's offended them for telling them the truth. I think we can all resonate with that, can't we? Uh, verses 12 through 16. You have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? So first of all, Paul reminds them of the great love that they showed to him originally when he came to them. Even though he came to them during a time of sickness, now, we don't know what this sickness was, okay? Um, but we do know from what Paul says that one of these two things is true, that the Lord either used that illness to kind of direct Paul to come to them. It was because of a bodily illness I preached the gospel to you the first time. Or he used that illness to extend Paul's stay with them. But Paul was sick when he came to minister to them. And even though this might have created an additional burden, you know, it, it's hard to take care of a person who's sick. I mean, just, just ask Donna. It was, wasn't that easy having somebody with COVID in the house for, you know, several weeks. It, it's hard to take care of someone who is ill. But he's saying that didn't matter to you, okay? You, you cared for me in this, in this condition. You didn't resent me for my illness, but you received me as an angel of God as Christ Jesus himself. You know, Jesus did say on one occasion that he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And so as Paul comes to them in the name of Christ, they received him as Christ, and they didn't care that he had this illness. He says their love and care for him was so strong, so intense, that he says this rather strange thing. They would have plucked out their eyes and given them to him if that would have ministered to his needs. And we have to ask the question, why in the world would they think that would do Paul any good? Well, this has led some commentators to see Paul's illness, that thorn in the flesh he refers to in 2 Corinthians, as some form of eye disease. You know, otherwise, what good would it do for the Corinthians to give him, give him their eyes, right? So, anyway, they... They didn't despise him, they didn't see him as a burden, but they loved him and they received him and they cared for him, okay? But now Paul asks the question, where is that sense of blessing that you had? Where did that love and that, that care go to, okay? The only thing that's changed is, Paul says, I've told you the truth about the Judaizers and the gospel quote, unquote, that they brought. Are you offended at me because I told you the truth? Now, again, can you relate to that? <laughs> you know, sometimes we can look at the truth, and all the truth that God gives us, He means for our good. It's all for our good. But sometimes we can see it as not good, right? And why do we see it that way? Or how, why is it that we can see it that way sometimes? And I think it's mainly because it places limits on maybe some enjoyment, some pleasure we want to indulge in that we know we shouldn't. And so we look then perhaps at God's Word as something bad. But we need to know that everything God tells us 
is always for our good. And it's not only for our good here, but it will lead to our greater good and our greater happiness throughout all eternity. So we, always, we need to understand God's truth is always good and we need to see it as good and we need to guard ourselves against the devil coming and saying to us, has God really said, are you sure that's really the right way? Are you sure this is God's word? Because you know, you're giving up this, this great amount of pleasure that you might be able to enjoy to follow these things you're not even quite sure are true. We, we need to make sure we have a firm conviction that the Bible is God's word. So we need to be careful how we receive the truth, but we also need to remember that even though we can see what God says is good, not everybody is going to see it the same way. I mean, even Christians can hate you for telling them the truth. And we know that's true because perhaps we've, we've been, you know, perhaps provoked by somebody telling us the truth. We just need to make sure that when we do it, that we're not using the truth to scourge them, okay? But we're using the truth to reclaim them and that we tell them gently and in love because we really want to help them. And, and that's what we see Paul doing, obviously, here. He's not trying to abrade them. What he's trying to do is he's trying to reclaim them because he loves them. That love makes all the difference in the world. And, and really, you can still love somebody very strongly, still tell them the truth, and they still will get angry at you. But I think they're much more likely to come around if they understand you really have their well-being in mind. And that was certainly Paul's case. <clears throat> now, finally, Paul asked them to contrast what was motivating the Judaizers with his motives. And again, their motives are quite diverse. We've already seen what Paul's are. He loved them. What was the Judaizers' motive? Well, Paul says the Judaizers were pursuing them so that they might pursue the Judaizers, okay? Verse 17, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Now, again, another one of these, you know, riddles, so to speak, that we have to un, un, um, unravel. But what he means here is this, that they wanted to shut, the, the Judaizers wanted to shut the Galatians out of the kingdom. And the way they were doing that was by telling them that the gospel that Paul brought was a false gospel so that they would have to rely on the Judaizers, they would have to pursue them for the truth so that they might be saved, okay? So the Judaizers' motive in what they were doing was to try to make the, the Galatians dependent on them, okay? Uh, it was purely a motive of self-interest. By the way, does that sound familiar? How many religious leaders have you seen on television, you know, perhaps other places, but I think they're mainly on television, uh, that seek to have some, you know, or that, that tell you they have some secret knowledge, some truth, the key to prosperity, the key to abundant life, you know, and they, they have all these things that they promise you so that you need to give your money to them and you need to become dependent on them and follow them. There, there's a lot of them, but that, that's essentially what, what these Judaizers are doing. And by the way, when somebody does something like that, when they organize their ministry so that you become dependent upon them, that is the mark of a false teacher. You know, a true teacher will make you dependent on Christ because that's, you know, it, ministers are to be a signpost pointing to Him. He's the one that has everything. You know, we are just as dependent as anyone else on, on the Lord. We are all dependent upon Him, not on any man but Christ. Now, that was their desire. You know, they pursued the Galatians so they might become dependent upon them, but Paul pursued the Galatians because he loved them. And I think that's what he says here in verses 18 and 19. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. 
Paul is saying there's nothing wrong with pursuing someone who has your best interests at heart, as long as they're teaching you the truth. <laughs> That's the, the best interest. There's nothing wrong with being pursued for that reason. So the, the, the Judaizers' motive was, was wrong. Paul's motive was out of love, and he desired to bring them to Christ. And so he said, to be sought in that way, that, that's commendable. That's good. These Judaizers, notice Paul was saying, had taken them backward with their gospel of works. Paul represents them as needing to be brought to birth again. My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. It's like Paul is saying, you were born, but you need to be born again. And I'm, I'm laboring, trying to bring you to this birth like, like a, a woman in labor. <laughs> okay? And that's what he did the first time when he brought the gospel to them. But now he's having to go through this process again. But I want you to notice again the intensity of, of Paul's care and concern for them. Where, where does Paul get this? This kind of love. Remember, Paul was, was a, a Jew, and he used to pull in his skirts as a Pharisee, you know, away from the Gentiles because they were unclean. But God had completely transformed his heart to the point where he's looking out at the Gentiles and he's his, this, this yearning, this earnestness, this desire to see them walk with Christ, that love, okay? Where does the intensity, this intense love come from? Well, it comes from, of course, the Holy Spirit that God gives through the new birth. We all have this if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it does need to be nurtured. And Paul is an example of what nurturing this love can actually produce, now, how would Paul know that he had been successful in his endeavors to bring them to birth? Well, first of all, they would embrace the truth. They would reject the Judaizers and, again, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but there was more. Christ needed to be formed in them. Okay? That's what he was looking for. That's what he said, didn't he, in, in this um, verse 19? My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. When we see the image of Christ in an individual, that is how we know that they have actually been brought savingly to Christ because that is the Spirit's work, to impress Christ's image on our souls and so on our lives when we begin to live like Him. Now, Paul did not see this in them, which is why he closes with these words, verse 20, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I, I don't know. He's saying, I don't see that. I see you going the wrong direction. I don't see you believing the truth. I don't see you being, uh, again, transformed into the image of Christ, so I'm not really sure what to think about you. Again, a challenge, right? And that's a challenge, really, that we need to leave, I think, with ourselves this morning, okay? Again, this is how we can know for ourselves and for others that we have been born again of the Spirit of God, and that is when we see the heart and life of Christ being formed in us, when we see ourselves becoming like Him. Now, again, that comes through the work of God's Spirit, but again, this is the importance of the means of grace, isn't it? I don't think we understand, I'm still coming to an understanding of these things after so many years, how important it is to be in the Word, to be in prayer, to be in worship, and to do these things publicly when we're gathered together and privately every single day because these are the ways, these these are the means that the Spirit of God uses to form Christ in us. It's not enough to just remember what it says. It's not enough to just lift up a token prayer. It's not enough just to go to church, you know, worship just every now and again. We need to be devoting ourselves to these things because when we are, we are doing these things, the Spirit of God is working through these things to transform us into the image of Christ. So, 
why is it that Paul had this such intense love and, and we may find ourselves having a difficult time working up the desire to, to go to our neighbor and to bring the gospel to them? It's because Paul was using these means. And by the way, obedience is another very important means. When we don't do what the Spirit of God is leading us to do, then we grieve Him and quench Him and we get weaker. But when we yield to Him, as Paul's going to tell us later in the book of Galatians, it strengthens His work in our lives and we become more like Christ. We have more of that desire, more of that affection. And that's really what we need to be working towards. So let's leave, our, let's leave this text this morning with that challenge uh, that we desire to see more of Christ in ourselves and in each other. And we pursue those things that we know are the ways in which we can become, the only way we can become more like Him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's, um, let's ask for the Lord's grace and prepare to come to the table, which is another means that God has given to us uh, to transform us into the image of Christ.